flight zone is for immediate... Wait a minute. Have you heard... This is a show to keep you on the edge of your seat. Citizens of America, welcome to the RadioCast. Hello and welcome to another episode of RadioCast. This week we are doing the TV show Dragnet. I'm uh, this week's host, Adam Carrero. And today we have in the room, we have Jack Kelleher and Joe Taff here Thank with you. us. Thank you for having me. So uh, this week we I choose uh, Dragnet. It's another well-known TV show. Kind of we haven't really dived into the public domain yet. We're still finding popular shows that have some following in some of the episodes that are in public domain. Uh, with Dragnet, the the first series when they came out on TV uh, from their radio broadcast were all ended up on uh, public domain. Um, it was originally American radio show, but then brought to TV and uh, later in film. But the first series uh, was from uh, Jack Webb. Right. <laughs> he was uh, the director, the writer, the producer, and also the star of the show for this first series. And also when they brought it back in the 60s. Um, later, they had uh, other actors play Joe Friday in like uh, the 80s movie. It was Dan Aykroyd. Um, but it was a character that was kind of almost like Dick Tracy. Everybody kind of know Friday and his stern approach to things. That was just, just the facts. That's and right. um, when this show kind of came out, it kind of put a perspective on the LAPD and how cops prestiged on um, – daily life to life and um kind of introduce people to know what the law of law officers uh presented themselves um this series went from 1951 to 1959 had nine seasons and had over 270 episodes um i think the first season was the only one that was very limited to the teens but after that they started racking up uh episodes season after season and season two three and four were rated the top five in the country and then it slowly staggered away and i think that's why they ended after nine seasons but um they later came back in the 60s with the series and uh two movies so it's mm. it's a character that people really know um and it kind of opened up eyes and we'll get into discussion um, more in the show, but how it started, it's kind of, you can kind of see other shows that came out later in the years that kind of based on it. And a um, couple episodes uh, that we pulled uh, that I pulled to show kind of shows that you get that idea. So um, the four episodes that we did were um, the human bomb, the big light, the big lamp, in the big phone call, uh, the human bomb was probably the only one that didn't have the big title. <laughs> um, I couldn't find out why they decided to go that way uh, with the big title on it. But um, let's um, before we go into the episodes, let's kind of go <laughs> on. Like, so like when I first heard of Dragnet, it was because of that 1980s movie uh, with Dan Aykroyd and Tom Hanks. But um, when did you guys kind of I... learn about Dragnet? Dragnet, we kind of like with quite a few of the shows we've done on the old time TV show. It's one of those series that I was aware of, but I'd never really seen anything of it. I've never, I'd, I'd, I'd never watched any of Dragnet. It's just one of those things I was aware of. And then, yeah, the first time I ever watched any episode of Dragnet was for this show. And as you said, like it would go on to be like, oh, you can see in future shows how this kind of laid the groundwork for a lot of future cop shows. And one of the first things I read about this was, as, as someone said that Dragnet is perhaps the most famous and influential police or procedural crime drama in American media history. And I haven't seen, like I'm not someone who's watched too many police procedural shows, but from the ones I have seen, I can definitely see the influence that this show has had on them. Yeah. About you, Joe? Yeah, I will agree. You can definitely see that influence. Personally, I had not heard of Dragnet. Um, it was a new show for me, even though it is definitely influential. And when I brought it up to my father, he actually he knew of the show. And he um, he was like, oh, Joe Friday? The, uh, just the facts, right? And so um, it's very funny. And he showed me the trailer to that to that movie from the 80s. And it was, uh, it was very funny that Tom Hanks was in it. 
and yeah. uh, looking young and spiffy and all that. But uh, no, it, it's very interesting because this show definitely paved the way for not just future shows, but also the public perception around police force like becoming more positive in the United States during the time. So it was a very uh, influential show in, in many aspects. And there are a lot of, uh, it's very interesting because <clears throat> Uh, like you said, seasons two, three, four, five were very popular. We only went through uh, season one episodes, if yeah. I am correct. So uh, got to see where it started. And there are quite a few bits of uh, interesting, there are quite a few interesting tidbits about season one uh, that people that I became privy to uh, just in learning about this show. So I'm pretty excited to talk about it. Yes. Yeah, something I definitely know is in like, and this is something that I read about the show. Well, us or as, more specifically the radio show. Uh, Jack Webb was inspired to make this after he had a small role on a on a 1948 a noir film called He Walked by Night. And he, he played a small, he had a small role as a, a, a forensic scientist for the police department in that movie. Mm -hmm. and, and that film had a very similar no-nonsense very documentary style and how it portrayed police work and Jack Webb was really inspired by that and he met the and he became very close friends with the police like with one of the police advisors for the movie whose name was Marty Wynn and they kind of started talking and collaborated and Jack Webb became very interested in wanting to show more of like the a no nonsense, very like factual depiction of police work, and he wanted to do it in his own words, without any of like the usual melodrama that at the time was in a lot of police dramas. <clears throat> he kind of wanted it to be like very like realistic, and also n not afraid to show the more monotone in. Um, a mundane aspects of police work and that is something we do see carry over into the TV show which because in all four of these episodes we do see things which aren't the most exciting aspects of police work such as them going to get witness statements them spending like they, they mentioned several episodes how they had they spend weeks if not months building evidence and like mm -hmm. having to get wiretaps and having to like follow suspects and yeah we see all yeah, like it's not all just like kind of like the flashy like car chases mm. and gun fights, which I don't think we get any of that in this show. It's more about the ways and methods the police use to yeah. get these suspects, which actually kind of makes sense because the show drag because dragnet itself is actually a police term, which yeah. means any system of coordinated measures for apprehending criminals as suspects, and that kind of is very fitting in mm. from from what I saw in the four episodes. Yeah, I think the only action that was shown was um, in the, that first episode, the human bomb, that them trying to get the bomb off of um, the perpetrator. That's right. But yeah, he's um, he really got into <clears throat> with the police, really knowing and researching um, stuff. Like if the opening when it shows the badge seven one four is actually the badge of one of the advisors that happened through the whole show. It was Sergeant Dan Cook. He was a technical um, advisor for the whole series and they used his badge number and mm. Dragnet, he just um, just kept like using it and with all the work that he did uh, writing into the, the script that the LAPD really allowed him to follow through and really get with the police work that and they realized like how much it helped the police department that once um i think i wrote down when he passed away but once jack webb passed away mm -hmm. um they retired the badge number just in in his honor right. so i think he's like the only civilian that kind of <laughs> got a badge retired for, not even a badge retired but got a badge placed with his name that didn't really get into law of, um, off being law officer. Yeah. yeah, I did read that he, uh, Jack Webb <clears throat> passed away in 1982 and he was actually giving yeah. a, he was given a funeral with full LAPD honors and yep. the badge was retired. So that just shows wow. how much, how Legend. close of a relationship he Legend. had with the LAPD and how yeah. much they respected mm -hmm. him. And yeah, you mentioned Joe, 
how the show kind of helped to portray police in a bit more positive. Hmm. That was actually kind of, I read that was actually uh, the deal he made with the LAPD because <laughs> when Jack Webb was getting, trying to get the radio show made, he wanted the LAPD's kind of endorsement and their support for it. And at first they were a little hesitant, but then the police chief at the time, 1949 Chief uh, Clemens B. Hall, he <laughs> basically said like, yes, you can make this show. We will help you make this. But you have, but you cannot show please in an unflattering light at all. Right, right. And that was kind of the deal they made. And kind of ironically, yeah. later that year, Chief Horrell resigned due due to a, a corruption scandal. Yikes! Yikes! <laughs> and I think a lot of the stories, like looking when I was going through all the episodes and reading all the synopsis of all each episode, it seemed like a lot of the topics were. Um, from real life um cases That's right. and that kind of and you see it at the end of each epi- episode like they change the names but they give you like what happened to the perpetrator and that's something yeah. that you kind of see now with law and order doing the same kind of bit like they'll mm-hmm. get real life stories and make an episode of it but law and order it's kind of a mixture of the courts and the police why dragnet was strictly with what the police officers do but the, like the other shows that right. we, and the other episodes that we kind of showcase that happened in, in did happen in the courtroom, That's right. but it was with Friday going in to do his case. Yes, it still surrounded him. Um, but with the first episode, the human bomb, you kind of saw a little bit of like the direction they were going with. Um, every episode, Jack Webb was the um, director of it but it was mainly between jack webb um, and two other writers that did most of the episodes for the first couple seasons i think later in the series of this first series there might have been one or two other writers but the Mm. first like three series is between jack uh james e moser and i think we got one more that was john robinson Mm. those are the three guys that um kind of wrote every single episode but you kind of saw the human bomb was kind of really directed into one action sequence involving one um, person it really didn't go fully in depth with the police like the other episodes that we um that we showcase but what i kind of laughed like you can tell it was the pilot because (laughs) some of some of the things like the placement of stuff or some of the shots like my the best one was like when they do the close-ups Mm-hmm. You can tell like they shot the wide shot and then they filmed the close up separate because it was like a de- delayed or yeah. they weren't looking it's in the just, right direction. Yeah, the eye line's a little off. Yeah. Like, <laughs> yeah. You're like, what's wrong here? Well, yeah. about the eye line, something that I read about and that I noticed more and more as I watched the show is that uh, Jack Webb, because he wanted to save time and money, did not he did not do rehearsals and every mm. scene the actors are reading off cue cards off to the side yes yeah oh and, yeah, yeah, and, yeah. yeah and being dubbed over that was another That's right. thing that they did yeah I, so mm-hmm. oftentimes you'll see the actors glancing off to the side as they say yes. the lines is kind of especially me, kind of remind me of like an snl skit where you can see the host <laughs> is like reading yeah. off cue cards especially in that one and yeah snl that and the uh the the phone the big phone call because in that one uh you, I was watching it with my dad this morning. He's like, they're reading. And I'm like, oh, that's funny because it's also voice, it's overdubbed, you know? So it's like, and I think that one looked the best. Like it had the best, uh, I don't know, the dub seemed the cleanest in that oh, one. Yeah, well, yeah. some of the other ones, maybe it was just the timing of the, of, the, of the feed, but it was like, oh, man. It's like, it doesn't even look like they're saying those words, you know? What yeah. I mean? but, no. So it's a little uh, inconsistent, but definitely very funny. And uh, I had also read the Jack Webb didn't feel because they did the radio show prior he didn't feel that he was the right choice to play um joe friday in the actual in the in the live action series yeah yeah, i read that too because he was mostly a voice actor yeah voice actor and Mm -hmm. he wasn't sure and he actually had to be uh, convinced to continue to play jack uh, joe Joe friday Friday in the show Mm mm-hmm and, Very interesting. Yeah. Another behind the scenes story I read was about TV producer Herbert L. Strzok. He was a p- producer and television director, and he was the director and editor of the pilot episode. Okay. And 
and because like this was the first TV show Webb had ever made, he really relied on Strzok a lot for like, like basically teaching him how to do this, like and, make the show. Yeah, yeah. And uh, according to Strzok, him and Webb would uh, clash uh, constantly during the first season over creative differences. And wow. That's why in season two, Strzok was fired. <laughs> and, okay. And Strzok would say later on that years later, him and he. Him and Webb would bump into each other on a plane, and Webb would actually apologize and said, uh, okay. "Hey, the only reason the show ended up being good is because I learned how to do it from you." And Strzok said, "Like, well, kind of too little, too late." <laughs> yeah, that <laughs> that is quite funny. Um, yeah, and you can kind of see like a different the direction went as because I th- think we I only choose one in the beginning. Like, yeah, it was only the pilot. The other three episodes that. I just happened to choose this later in that in that season. Like we did the big phone call was episode twelve. Uh the big lamp was episode fourteen, and then the big light was in season two, but episode twenty. Oh, okay. Yeah. And then that one like okay. the, with the big light, you kind of did see more yeah. of um a storyline. Not a storyline, but more dramatic shots, like in the yeah. courtroom and yeah. kind of yeah. build yeah, yeah, up yeah. with the story. As well, like the other ones um, were kind of more just procedure. Yes, I yes. like I choose the, I, the one thing I liked about the big phone call is it was um, just shot in one set. So really yeah. relied on the three actors to tell the story and just keep changing the camera angles and to like break it up. Like sometimes when they play the tapes, you would have like a weird camera angle, like through the cassette tape that's turning yeah. or quick B cuts into different things mm-hmm. just to break it up. But it just that's like back then you kind of didn't think of just having that for a story for a TV episode, right. just one room, three guys. And that's the whole timing of it. Yeah. And something I noticed in that episode, speaking of the cinematography is that the person they're trying to basically, they're trying to get this guy to confess to a crime and as this episode goes on, kind of the camera kind of gets closer and closer and closer to him. Mm, yeah. That by the end, when he finally confesses, it's like this very a tight close up on his face, and you can see like he's sweaty and he, like he's just finally worn out and he's yeah. given up. But I really like that shot. Yeah. The one thing I like, I think like every episode, I found something hilarious in it, like the human bomb. I don't know what it was. The way the captain had his gun holster in like the weirdest place, and like. <laughs> He had to like if he had to pull the gun out, he had to go across his body. I was like, "There's no way he can That's pull awesome. that gun quick enough." So the, the, yeah. he's not a quick John McGrath like <laughs> shoot. Like he's he better be a marksman because that's the only way he's gonna get somebody. <laughs> but with the phone call, um, he kept trying to call his wife, and every time his wife didn't pick up, that that's what seemed pushed him over the edge to confess. Now so much Friday and his partner kept yeah. questioning, like, we know what you did. You just got this. Like right. he was he wasn't totally fine with that. that. It was just like every time he got a busy call, that's what I was like, this yep. wife is yep. like getting me. And, and they after knew. he's like, No, I'm done. Yeah. I'm done with my wife. Yeah. And yeah. yep, yeah. I did it all because of her and yep, take me away. Yeah, he kinda like <laughs> blames the whole thing on her at the end. Which I, I did oh, find I that funny how he was just like I kept giving him money, but it was never stupid enough. enough. So stupid. Yeah. I, was, I was like, yeah, this was definitely written in the 50s. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, it's uh, all her fault. Jeez. But yeah. And also, I kind of want to quickly go back to the human bombing. You mentioned yeah. the police chief. Uh, and for this episode only, he was played by actor Raymond Burr, who I don't know, who you may recognize as the mm. potential murderer in the movie, Albert Hitchcock movie Rear Window. He's also famous for being in the American version of the original Godzilla movie, where they, oh boy, where they edited him in into the movie as oh, basically geez. the main character. <laughs> what? Yeah, like, but was it just it was him? Yeah, like Raymond Burr had a long, had a kind of very long career, so it's interesting just seeing him only for this one episode, and then he never came back, and the role got recasted. Yeah, I couldn't was like that. Normally, sometimes when you look at shows and you find out, like, when they do the pilot, and they'll, like, list of, like, when they actually did get picked up. Um, I really couldn't find info on, like, Dragnet when the pilot was made or if it was just one of those that they just automatically booked, like, the full season and just cast it that way. Yeah, like, did were they, like, 
trying to pitch like the, the whole series or was it already just yeah. a, a, a given that they were going to get the series yeah yeah because that, yeah that happens like sometimes when they, right. they'll do a pilot have a couple characters in it and then they get picked up and they get a either recast or yeah like um the big one i can think of now is like the office um and i can't remember the, her character's name uh the one that with the, the glasses that sat behind Dwight. Uh, uh, Phyllis? Phyllis. There you go. She originally wasn't going to be in the series. She was the casting director. <laughs> no way. Uh, no, she wasn't the, the casting director. She worked for the casting company. Oh, my and goodness. And just kind of sat like in the background as a filler. And then we got picked up. And then she slowly got into put into the series. And then they started, wow. as the series started going, they started bringing those back background characters into it so it got more involved but yeah she was a, she was working for the casting company and this kind of got thrown in so the wow. same thing might have happened with the captain it's like oh we need yeah. somebody and they asked him to come in and then it got picked up and it's like ah, I, I gotta do this or yeah you gotta fit in somewhere the cast of this series definitely jumps around throughout i from what we saw it stays pretty uh central but from the research i did like there are actors, there are characters who end up kind of just like dissipating uh, yep. into the wind a little bit. And then they just kind of become a different character, the actor. Um, but one character slash actor that I have to mention, because we're talking about that first episode, is Sergeant Ben Romero, who was played by Barton Yarborough. And he was uh, Friday's original partner. But after the second episode, Yarborough unexpectedly died, passed away, and uh... they had to recast and so they ended up recasting with uh, they had a, a, a one off for episode three and then it became Sergeant Ed Phillips, who was played by Barney Phillips. No, sorry. Sergeant Ed Jacobs. Yeah. Played by Barney Phillips. Um, he was four through uh, 14. And then it ended up becoming uh, Officer Frank Smith, who I remembered from the the first episode that I watched was the big light, the Hollywood uh, yeah. set one. And I remembered uh, Officer Smith. Like I was like, oh, yeah, that, that guy's cool. Uh, but then I did the research after. Um, so I thought that was, I mean, obviously very sad. And uh, I guess in season two, there's an episode where Friday kind of reminisces on uh, the death of his of his partner. Who we only had for two episodes, uh, but definitely a bummer that 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 happened so early in the show. Yeah, because that original actor, he was the voice of the partner on the radio show. Okay, like, so they he had worked with Webb. Got gotcha. you on the on the radio show, so they were probably close friends. So he probably did legitimately miss him. Yeah, that's brutal, actually, because like that's just what the show was to them at that time. Yeah, that's that's tough. That's tough. Yeah, he had. Yeah, I think he only had like four different partners throughout, and then yeah, like it listed all the partners for each uh, episode. But then once it got to like the later seasons, it was just they either stopped listing them or they just decided sometimes not to do. Um, any partners right like they yeah. just let it be a friday episode. yeah i was looking yeah. like through most of the like the first couple seasons i so i didn't go that deep but i know like mm -hmm. on the listing they did list the partner but right. yeah um with the big light like the one the one thing like continues like there's like a funny thing in every single episode for that one with yeah. the big light was like more when the jury came back not guilty and like the judge oh my goodness who wasn't in a robe which i thought that was weird i was like ah, i thought they always did that but like him oh, just being i like, think i don't think that's the big light the I, big light is the movie set episode i know, I know the big lamp the big lamp, lamp. Yeah, yeah the big lamp is the one that takes place in the but you're on you're on track for that the big lamp is the uh the yeah courtroom. it's kind of confusing that those two episodes are pretty oh much yeah, the yeah, same yeah for sure no yeah, yeah it totally it makes sense but the big lamp um yeah, I did find that really funny when just when they came back not guilty, the judge was just like, "You're either liars or you're all idiots." Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> but, I have the line. It's okay. um, here is it. It's uh, you're either innately dishonest or you're all morons. <laughs> like I feel like a judge would get despised nowadays yeah, if he just know, started insulting the jury like oh my that. Goodness. But yeah. watching that whole episode, I could just see I'm like, oh, this is just like Law and Order. I was like, oh, okay. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You see it coming through. You're like, oh, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. The the this is the influence. You know? Yeah. Like besides Law that and Order too, episode, um, the X Files I read too kind of got uh, with the procedure wise. So it's more like. The aspect of Joe Friday going with the procedure is the same way as like with X Files. Right, they go through they the progression it. of like yeah, of how to do the cases yeah. and yeah, that's pretty cool. 
Yeah, something I did appreciate about this, and I think it was when I was watching The Big Lamp, I started to appreciate about this show is that at least every episode we watched was about something different because the first episode I watched was The Big Light, which is about them on the set trying to solve a murder. And I yeah. kind of was thinking, is every episode going to be like this? Just them going to a scene and solving a murder? And I thought that too. Yeah, I was kind of pleasantly surprised. See, there's actually a pretty wide uh, diversity of topics for this show yeah because like this episode the big l lamp is them trying to c uh, catch a thief who they know is committing these crimes it. but is getting away with it yeah. and the early episode the big call uh, the big phone call was them trying to get a suspect to confess and who's the first, already yeah and the first episode was like them trying to d defuse a a bomb threat so yeah, yeah. It, it wasn't like every because Kind of one of my bigger issues with just police procedural dramas in general is that they just get very repetitive after a while. Right. You know, but like, like the big stuff. Yeah, but like, I was pleasantly surprised. You know, like, kind of like the first real police procedure show ever, it wasn't just the same thing every week. They did their best to try and make it a new story every episode. Yeah, and another series that kind of does that, it, it gets a little weird of it, but Chips that police <laughs> so they they did the same kind of concept like every episode was a different thing that they have to solve or they had to save what made it a little ridiculous is like their motorcycle officer so <laughs> everything they did was like off of motorcycles it's like i don't know if they could do this with a motorcycle <laughs> but it was the same but idea it's cool, though man. yeah it's cool but it was the same idea that they had um, each episode, they're involving a different aspect of police. Either it's a chase or it's saving a kid from like a crash or a fire. Mm -hmm. or they had to investigate stuff. That's like there's so much you can do as a yeah. as a motorcycle on the motorcycle. So they kind of did that same kind of thinking writing writing wise for the mm -hmm. stories. Yeah, and like in the big lamp, we see like them using a lot of like. Uh, we see them doing a lot of like a surveillance and a stakeouts, like following this mm -hmm. suspect who they think is breaking into all these safes. And then at the end, mm -hmm. we see them using a pretty advanced, yeah. like a uh, advanced like a uh, forensic evidence to yes. finally get him with the chemicals. Uh, yeah, and the ultraviolet. Which a part of me was wondering, would that hold up in court? I was going to say, like, it's almost entrapment. Yeah, because uh -huh. I, I feel like a good lawyer, defense lawyer could argue, yeah, because how they catch him is they sneak into his apartment and put like this invisible chemical all over his clothes. And then they go to, when a safe is broken into, they they shine a light on, a, a special lamp onto the safe, and it shows all the handprints from that chemical. Mm. And then they shine it on him, and you see it's all over his hands. I feel like... a good defense lawyer could argue like well just because you put it on him doesn't mean he left those handprints you could have put those handprints there yourself yeah they didn't break it down to be like oh we got perfect fingerprints i'm gonna match up the fingerprints to your fingerprints yeah. it's just like nope you got the chemical everything's the same yeah like, yeah they, it was kind it of just like yeah. they showed the smudges and it's like well that was clearly you he also uh i think he mentioned he kind of he kind of gave it up in the living room there uh, yeah he was like i forget the, the exact line but then friday hit him with a quick zinger on the way out he's like yeah you won't need you won't need him where you'll be going buddy yeah and with one of those oh, yeah like um, he has to, he, he has like he asked, like, he asked if he could clean off his clothes first, and they're like, you yeah. won't need him, will you? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. So maybe he didn't really give himself away, but... Yeah, they definitely did a good job, like, um, showing the progression of, like, how the police yes. did the procedures. But it's always, like, when they caught the guy that it was always like, all right, yep, it's done. And they just, like, end it, like... Tell him what he's he, got. And, yeah, yeah, even yeah. with, like, uh, when he... The guy for uh, the big lamp that went out... And not, I mean... Um, the big yeah the big lamp when yeah. they went up to the movie studios oh, the big light he, no the, the big light. light you're good yeah, the big light, the big the big light. light. I, yeah you're good. and he went up in the catwalk and it's like oh we're gonna get him down no he has to come down sometime and then cut to did, black yeah done. cut to black done yeah I know that was so funny it's like that was when it's, it's like, like stuff just started to get good like, yeah, you know? yeah. Like, I'm pretty sure somebody has to go up there yeah. chase him down yeah, yeah most so, likely it's a waiting game now. yeah but I, I do I do want to mention about the big lamp because this was probably my favorite moment of all the episodes and it was in that courtroom uh First off, there are some great lines in this episode throughout. Uh, in Friday's monologue, in the or his introduction monologue, yeah, he referred to Conrad Buckley as ex-con, two-time loser, <laughs> and, uh, and, he, and, he, and, he, and they're you know they're trying to get him bagged, and 
he he goes up to Lee Jones or Leland Jones, uh, and and he's and he's they're trying to figure out. He's like, yeah, I gave my testimony this morning. Cool. And they're like, all right, uh, uh, courts in session. And Friday's hitting a cigarette, and they go, no smoking, please. Oh. <laughs> Which I found quite funny. Just the words, no smoking, please. Like you know, we're enforcing the law nicely. But anyway, uh, they you know it, it starts going, and then Leland Jones takes the stand. And what I think is the best moment of these episodes, he goes up there and with help from the prosecutor's lawyer, who is setting him up, setting up some perfect questions. He (laughs) the way that they communicate this message of like he knows that this guy is guilty. I just thought was done so well. You know, the the lawyer's like, Mr. Jones, how can you be so sure? And, And Leland hits him with, well, you know, I base it on the application of the law of probabilities to such a case as this. And it's just so cold, like the best line delivery I think ever. And it's great writing too, honestly. And like, it feels real. Um, but then, you know, he finally, he's like, oh, I wasn't really with him at first. He's, uh, he has to be wearing this, uh, this clothes, the, you know, these, this pair of pants, this shirt, the, the, you know, uh, with this in his pocket. Okay. Okay. So you add up all those and it's one in one trillion. Oh, can you, can you explain the magnitude of that number? And he goes, that's more people that have lived on earth since the beginning of time. And that's like just how confident he is that Buckley did it. And I just thought that was so, I was like, I'm watching. I was like, it was like that man. He just destroyed this guy. And then for them to say not guilty, is just like, Oh my God. Yes. What? Because it was the perfect, like, it's like, dude, you just, you just ended this guy's chances. No. Yeah. That part kind of confused me of like, because they never really gave a full reason for why the jury found him not guilty. They had yeah. like a brief conversation where they said that it was it was, it was just because the jury just didn't care. Yeah, like, they were kind of just not really. Yeah, that was weird. Like, it seemed like there. a bit of a weird excuse, but eh. Leland Jones yeah. had me captivated. I'll tell you that. If I was on that jury, come on, I would have been like all over it. Well, not only that, with the lawyer too, when he was given the, he kept he, looking at the jury. I yeah, yeah, yeah. He to keeps be like, checking them. He's like, oh, see if it's this guy's well. rambling too long. Okay, the next yeah. question. And right, he goes right, and right. Speeds it up. He, yeah, he definitely like he was definitely rambling, but he had like that that he had a point that he was getting to. That's why I was like, yeah, is he going somewhere with this? But he definitely did. And I and I find it I like too that you know in the scenes that come after this, you get Friday and you know we've re- we've mentioned that in all these episodes. The court process is very quick. Yeah. Like it's all the detec- detective stuff and then they get to the sentence and it's one line and then it's over. You've learned a little lesson. But this one's like the whole thing has to do with the corruption of that. And it's and I found it very interesting and, and how Friday feels like his hands are tied. He's sitting there like, I can't I can't really do anything about this. But obviously he does. He does his detective work and stuff. But um, and he uses uh, Leland Jones <clears throat> for his amazing of uh, forensic evidence uh no it might not have actually worked but it is fiction i guess but at the end of the, like we were saying too they had a um uh like a like a person on set like they, they had connections to the police force in yeah. la and stuff like that and they had like a uh, an assistant who was like making sure everything was still i think that probably has to do with why the episodes are very diverse uh, like you know that's why you get a little bit of this in this one a little bit of that in the other one but um yeah yeah, because a few of the advisors I do know was like that guy who was the advisor for that movie that Jack Webb worked on, Amani yeah. Wynn. He helped with the show, and Jack Webb did a few ride-alongs with him. Okay. Another person who was a friend of Webb, who the advisor was a detective of the LAPD called Danny Agolino, who worked some of LA's most notorious cases, such as the Black Dahlia murder. Okay. And he was also a, one one of the detectives during the Tate. Habianca murders by the Manson family. So wow. he saw a lot. And yeah, was, yeah. And like a few of like his cases became like plots of the episodes. Okay. Yeah, and coming from well, it just happened that they were filming it in California. That's where a lot of TV shows. But like mm. with LAPD, I feel like they would have the more popular, not popular, but kind of the bigger cases to base off a lot of yeah. stuff yeah yeah for sure like they always mentioned the beginning of the episodes just how like how much crime there is how big yeah. of a city it is and like i really appreciate the uh the openings of the episodes for that and also just like the cinematography i love the wide establishing shots of the city and like very busy shots like i love there's the you know there's a lot going on uh the buses and the people and the bustling of it and all that and the monologue very good openings but yes yeah la and also the opening 
monologue line of like the story, I'm a cop. like the story about the sea is true, <laughs> I love but the name has been changed to protect the innocent. Yep. Well, probably a few of the cases were based in real life. Like, like was the opening one the human bomb? I feel like if that was a real life case, we'd know about it. If like that someone tried yeah. to blow up town hall of Los <laughs> Angeles, <laughs> That'd be a big one. So I feel like that was not true, and it kind of reminded me of like the opening of the movie know. Fargo by the Coen Brothers, where they say huh. like the story about the sea is true. The name's been changed to protect the innocent, but Fargo was based on no true story. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so I wonder if it, if it was kind of more of a bit of like a gimmick to like draw audiences in. Yeah. yeah it probably, hey. it would, they probably like this part of somebody trying to go blow up to get somebody released is probably true, but the aspect of like, oh yeah, the cop, is, we're going to lower him from a window to another yeah, window. that was bold. And him going on the edge and like... <laughs> What's kind of funny is like when they when they showed that I know it was like a fake it wasn't on the real building, but I don't know why I was thinking I was like, is he still upright or is he crawling? Because all I can picture is like the old Adam West Batman and Robin. <laughs> oh I then, didn't think of that. Yeah, yeah, them climbing on the building, but they're not going up and down. They're going across, and they get the wind blowing for that cape to look like it's dripping down. That's right. That's so I'm right. like thinking I was like. Is he on, is the stage upright or is it vertical yeah. so he doesn't really fall? Yeah, they might have flipped it to kind of give him that uh, give him that safety, but you can it's kind of like a camera trick too. Yeah, it's yeah. something that did make me very laugh, classic. Kind of going back to the human bomb is like when they tried to lower his partner down so he could get behind the bomber and you just kind of like hear him bang against the wall. <laughs> and then later, blows it. after that, he comes in and he looks like crap. Yeah. Like he has like bruises all over his body. His clothes are all messed up. I was like, man, he really, I'm like, man, he really went yeah. through it. They went through it. Yeah. Yeah. He went through, through it out there. Well, you should see the other guy, <laughs> the window. But yeah, but him like, I think like the last, shot he might have hit the window but before hitting it and he's like ah oh, see i hear him somebody outside but what's funny is like when in the monologue he talks about like oh yeah this is special granite and like all the stone work and i'm yeah, like yeah you wouldn't hear the feet hit the stone and i was like you would hear <laughs> it hit the window but yeah you heard it like hit the cardboard of the, yeah. of the set <laughs> so look like, oh, there's somebody outside I was like, all right. it just sounds like a little like well, it was the pilot episode. They right, right. Didn't, exactly. They probably didn't have too much exactly. of it. No, no, no. It was just like, and like yeah. the whole water bucket thing, like running it down and oh, how, doing yeah, the elevator. Yeah. I'm like. That can't be like, is that still up to code, code, up to code here in modern day 2023? Just Well, I was oh, thinking got that. The bombs, I was like. Put it in a bucket of water. I mean, that's the first thing immediately. First thing I do, bucket of water. Second thing, run with it. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, run with it and go in the elevator. I'm like, how fast can this? I'm like, well, no, it's the fifties. The elevator is probably not as go. safe, so the elevator yeah. probably did go down quick. Yeah. Something that <laughs> I thought, like, if it was like a modern day cop show of this scenario, I feel like how this situation would have ended would be Joe Friday would have opened the window, thrown the bomb out, and would have would have like exploded, exploded outside, outside the yeah. building. Like yeah, that's how yeah. a modern show probably would have Absolutely. ended that situation. Yeah, and when he showed up, they had exactly the amount of time before the bomb goes off is the length of the episode. I was realizing that he's like seven minutes, seven minutes, Joe. And yeah. I look, I'm like, oh, there's seven minutes left, or like yeah. eight minutes left, because once there's that extra, that final. Yeah, minute but of, when he came, yeah, when they came in, it's like. Yeah. Oh yeah, when I walked in, we fifteen had minutes, twenty four minutes before the bomb yeah. goes off in the beginning of the episode. I'm like, oh, that's how much the episode yeah. is. So. Yeah, 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 with commercial yeah, yeah. times and everything else. <laughs> yeah, because like movies he, do that. Yeah, because he had the opening line right before the mall like, ended, where it's like here, yeah, like here's like here are the next twenty minutes. Oh, like here's the next twenty six minutes yeah. of this incident. And that just kind of reminded me a little of like the opening monologue of like say twenty four, where he's like, yes, same, where he's like. And these are the longest 24 hours of my life. Yeah. Oh, yeah. You're like, so probably not inspired by that, but it just kind of made me, mm. it kind of just made me think of that. Think and of that one. Yeah. Speaking of sets, about like the episode, The Big Light. Yes. That takes place primarily on a movie set. And I was wondering, was this just the set? That they like, did they just film this on like the background of the set that they use for the show? I was wondering that. Well, I there's I like three, I think this, including that one, I think there's two more episodes that happen to take place on a movie set. But I was like, I'm they're in LA and like out back then, Hollywood was like the thing to do, like 
that was happening it wasn't like now that you stop filming stuff all over the world mm-hmm. so i'm like of course yeah. there's gonna be cases but it was kind of like convenient that it's like why don't we just use this set over here for this episode and exactly. just go film it there? exactly i mean they're yeah. already in la exactly. yeah yeah, yeah. So, so i wonder like all like kind of the extras for the episode who are like crew members were those like crew members on the show yeah, hey. like people from hollywood who they just grab like hey you want to be a background guy yeah for this just scene? get a little extra money like jerry on the side yeah boy, also kind of boy jerry speaking yeah. of hollywood as soon as they the episode was called the big light just do they were, they mentioned there's an accident on a film set i was like let me yeah. guess a guy got the guy got Smashed crushed by, by a falling light, light and lo and behold it was had to imagine it would be like <laughs> that is like a very common trope and just murder mystery cop shows like yeah. someone on a set being someone. crushed by a falling light and yeah. i feel like was this the first show to media to do that trope do you mean it, the trope of like a of, of somebody uh passing on a movie set or just like on in i know like the trope of like that very uh, specific method of oh killing like someone, a, like is, a almost like a whodunit type vibe like i know just like just the like, method of someone being crushed by a falling oh set just the falling light, light. The, oh the falling light okay, yeah because i've seen that, that specific. In, i've seen that in so many like movies tv shows yeah. just that trope and even yeah. like sh- shows nowadays are still kind of using it i don't know if you've seen the i believe it's on peacock it's called poker face i've not it's yeah. Kind of a show that's sort of like a love letter to like shows like Dragnet and or Columbo, oh, cool. where there's kind of like the case of the week, and one of them involves a death on a set where they mm-hmm. use at first it looks like they're going to use the trope of the person gets crushed by the light, but then something else happens. Oh so, yeah, like reversal of an expected trope. That's good. Yeah. So. Th- so that trope is still alive and well. Alive and well, baby. Especially in a. I was going to say like. Even though I haven't seen those, uh, I have played Hitman, <laughs> and uh, you, there's quite a bit of that, uh, and yeah. in, in, you know, in, in different video games and stuff, they use that quite a bit. Um, Which I'm kind of surprised they still use it now, because I think nowadays with those kind of lights, it's like there's so many safety um, components to the light. Yeah. Like back then, it'd probably be like, yeah, if you just don't do this one thing, this light could someone. Move. Now it's like, no, so they designed it this way and then you got this safety feature and then this safety feature yeah. so it's like hard nowadays to do it but back, back then it's like yeah if you don't put that pin in yeah anybody can die <laughs> <laughs> not enough duct tape yeah nope. not, not yeah that's it's it. like <sighs> that's it. Sorry. back then it's just like that little thing it's yeah. like yeah you just hook it on and it just stays there yeah yeah it's fine how it's heavy fine. is this light nowadays 175 pounds it's yeah. just that one hook yeah, but you put the safety pin in it. It should work. <laughs> it's, it's no big deal. That's it. No big deal. Nowadays, somebody would be fired like immediately. I mean, I was thinking about, you know, if if this were to happen in real life. And and, and I think that some of it would hold true. Like you've seen on a lot of different productions, movies, TV, when, when people pass away, whether it be the director or a star actor or anybody, a stunt guy, like the show goes on majority of the time. I mean, even if it's the director. So... It's definitely um, at first in my head. I'm like, oh god, they would have this. They would have shut this down. But I'm like, ah, oh, maybe not. Like you know, like they they put a lot of money into these things, yeah. and so it's definitely um, it is um, telling of what happens in real life in that regard too. Even though it's not a show a show about movies or anything yeah. like that. Yeah, I noticed that too. Where well, kind of nowadays, you when these things happen, the show goes on, but usually the kind of shut down for like a. Uh, they at least shut it down for a little bit. Right. Here, they are still like the vet, like the same, oh, basically the same twelve hours that the yeah. body has been found. The light is still there. The light is still on the <laughs> They're ground. They're setting up for another shot. Like they are still filming, and <laughs> and the just, director is getting buried. As someone who's just been on sets before, a kind of a line that just I appreciated was the uh, production yeah. manager had a line where he what said. Was it? Where he was describing his job, he was like, uh, "My job is just I do a little bit of everything around here." <laughs> good. As nice. someone who has been on a movie set, I like, yeah, I feel that. I feel yeah, that's that. a good one. That's a good one. That and like no caution tape, no police tape. It's just yeah. they use yeah, their yeah, regular that. sign that says "hot set," <laughs> so no one walks on it. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's like if you don't put this hot set sign, they might still go on a set. So no matter what the police tape is, they might <laughs> think it's it. a prop. So we got to put this sign up. It's the only line of defense yeah. against anything happening. Chain link fence and hot set. <laughs> but I love. I mean, when you get into the nitty gritty of this episode, and when 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 Friday's trying to figure out, you know, who did it. Um, it's. I think it does 
have an interesting path as to how they find out who it is because when they get to Sam, he uh, this is the it might be the production manager. He slips up multiple times before he says like because they ask him about the note and he yeah. does at first he says he doesn't know about the note but then he's like oh yeah I, I gave a note to Bradley um, but yeah it, and then it ended up being Jerry but it definitely uh, felt at that moment I'm like oh man this guy's blowing it like, oh it yeah was him Th- that made like because like in like sixty seconds he remembers like Every- three or four <laughs> times he's like he was lying oh, I, oh this didn't happen. Oh wait! Now that you mention it, I do remember this. I did give but him that a happened note. like three or four times within a minute. I was like, "How is this that man not arrested?" Stretch. Yeah, that was a you stretch. You walked over to the set. No, I didn't walk over to the set. I went. Oh wait, I did go through the door, but I was going past that <laughs> yeah. to go to this. Also, like, as they walked, sorry, as they walked away from him, I'm like, "Bro, you're letting him get away. Like, why are yeah. you not putting him in cuffs?" Also, something that just made me laugh about the character of Sam is that he, like, before we meet him. He's kind of looking like the main red herring or suspect. And mm-hmm. people mention how he is very strong, that he is strong enough to he lift this 200 light, 100 <laughs> pound light, and that he had once fought totally off two bagged. cops while drunk. We meet him, and he's like this short, middle aged looking man <laughs> yeah. who looks like a stiff wind could knock him over. And I was like, oh, this guy. Like, are we yeah. talking about the same man? Yeah, yeah so that part just made Joe me laugh. Friday put, Joe Friday puts his hands on him. This guy's got no chance. You gonna tell me you took down two cops? Yeah, and connecting Dragnet to Law and Order. So there's uh, comedian has a skit John Mulaney about Law and Order mm-hmm. and making fun of like how people like on it when the cops question them, be like, like going to a bar. It's like sees thousands of people. Like, wait a minute, I do know that person. They were fighting, <laughs> and like that, the questioning originates. for them like kind of originates to be like, well, what about this? I don't know what you talk about. But wait, yeah, I do. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. He was fighting that time. <laughs> yeah, I do remember that yeah. stand up where he's like, huh. he, he, he's like, where every bartender in New York can remember every single detail of every person they have ever met. Yeah, yeah and yeah. when they were like going through like the whole set, it's like, like yeah, and, he's, and there's also the bit where he says, like, and he says, and they always interview one guy who's loading something up while they're talking at the same time. And we kind of see that happening in the set where people are like tying stuff up and working while talking yeah. at the same yeah. time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that's a, all over the place. And that's like a trope that would, happens in a lot of cop shows. Just yeah. Like, but people who are like loading things into a barrel while talking at the same time. Yeah, like the one thing I didn't see, it, it could go later in the series, um, but like the first couple, at least the first season, you didn't, besides like wrestling um people down to arrest them or anything sure. else you really didn't see yeah. like the cops using that the physical the force. physical yeah. aggression or that gun or yeah. anything like that well when they did it in the pilot it wasn't that or no the bomb the big the the big the, the big was that the bomb the, the, no, human, the human bomb, bomb. the human bomb yeah, oh yeah no it's not the big bomb yeah. the human bomb yeah and that one which was the pilot like the physicality wasn't that great in my opinion. i mean no. i know it's the 50s but like wasn't that great when he put his hands on him? So I think it. I think that the best, you know, the best parts of the show are, you know, not that right. No, I think they yeah. realize that immediately. So like, it's just though, the same dialogue. thing with the with the big with the big light. You know how at the end you get, um, they're like, all right, let's 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 wait him out instead of like running up there. Like yeah. I thought the chase, the shot of of Jerry booking it in that one was was awesome. When uh, when they're he like. Yep. Tur- he turns off and runs and like pushes this dude he runs up the stairs and it was like I was like oh man it's on you know like and I love too the, the cinematography from that episode I would be remiss if I didn't mention the cinematography from that episode I thought was really really fun camera was moving around like all over the set and it was like compared to that first one you know because you had mentioned oh, right. was that pilot um, was it trying to make the series really happen and it's like well that episode took place in one or two rooms that one was like two the big phone call was literally one the uh the big light that was a, a, i mean unless it was their set that was a pretty big set and like did you say that one was season two yeah that light? was yeah season yeah two, so yeah. that makes you feel like maybe bigger budget they had bigger like uh budget to like move the camera around and do different stuff like that so i could definitely feel that that one um it felt like they were more established. Like this is what our show is. Yeah, for you know? the season two. Yes. Yeah. yeah, yeah. But the other ones being later in the seasons. But yeah, like you tell the mm-hmm. cinematography, they're like, all right, we only have like to do this much, so let's do the shots to really showcase the story. So like, exactly. 
the the big phone call and uh, the the lamp. Yeah. Um, would they really use the camera shots to really showcase definitely that? Yeah, it's really fun. It's really fun. I thought it was great for nineteen fifty one or sixty one. It was a fifty one or sixty one. Uh, no, fifty. Uh, yeah, fifty. 51 and then yeah season two was 53 they were whipping that thing around i thought that was awesome um and when you mentioned too uh how like it became a super common trope for you know oh yeah i remember that the big phone call um i mean the way that that uh and we're kind of jumping around but the, the way that that conversation like progressed and how you know the the part with uh <clears throat> with his wife it was just it was just really funny how um how he was honestly before the wife part when he was like uh denying you know his, his denial is the guy's name uh garvey yeah ernest garvey and he's like <laughs> i'm not one of them cheap hoodlums hoodlums uh <laughs> when he tries to get up in friday friday's like sit down <laughs> like nah just, just sit down uh but there, there's a bunch yeah he's like who, who gave you that information and friday goes nobody gives us the information we got it ourselves I was like, "Ooh, that was cold." I'm like, "That's a good one." This guy's going nowhere, but he's threatening to sue and different things like that. Um, just the different, uh, the back and forth during like the middle of that con- that middle of that episode in that conversation, it was fiery. It was like, you know, he he's like, "I'm going to sue you for every dollar you have," you know, and the the cops are just like, "All right, buddy, we've heard it before." <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it's very well. Yeah, it's, it's very it's, funny. Speaking of the back and forth, I kind of. Do you want to mention a term <laughs> called uh, dragnet editing, okay. which is something that has kind of become a, a term for editing, which is, you probably notice this a lot during the scenes of people talking, where uh, dragnet editing follows a formula. It's like, the camera cuts to actor A, they say their line. It cuts to actor B, they say their line. It cuts back to actor A, who says their line. Back to actor B, they say their line, and so on and so forth. Truly <laughs> complex. Where, like, you have... Yeah, Oh, yeah, like that's now kind of known as dragnet editing because okay. that's how like almost every boom, scene boom, between boom, actors boom, would boom. go. Like it would cut from one, one line, like it always line, cut one. from one shot to the other. An actor would say the line, it would cut back, and there yeah. wouldn't be a whole lot of like overlapping dialogue. That yeah. episode was the one where I felt like that style of editing was the most effective because it was like, oh man, like they're getting into it a little bit. And even though in reality the cops really weren't giving them like that much lip back, it was like, oh, like. The, the editing is like boom 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 you know and, and like you said we're getting a little bit closer on him every time so it's like he's getting more and more worked up throughout that was a great episode um the big phone call you know that was that yeah, was a good a, time and cutting it back and forth they really like positioned the camera that it didn't look so displaced cutting it like it was yeah the first in the pilot it wasn't episode. too jarring yeah yeah the that pilot. it wasn't like so boxy like it, like yeah. the way it had like the head shot when it cut to that one person and then back exactly. to another person this was more natural like to Much get cleaner. like you could see them it's more of a conversation talking instead of mm-hmm. cut all mm-hmm. right the person's there you can tell it's like a different shot why like this yes. one so much was more, more flowing yeah more natural yes, the camera cuts seem like it was they probably could have shot it the same way like we'll set up the camera you do all your dialogue this way we'll set up the camera this way but the way they positioned it that it seemed like the camera was just flowing back and forth during the conversation yeah it was much it was much cleaner than that that first one that the pilot it was a little jarring when they would cut into the close-ups you're like what the heck yeah you know it felt like it's like the they were like standing in a different spot almost you know the angle is just off yeah, yeah which i couldn't find too much info on like the c- cinematographer or anything like that it was more just the the writers and the directors of it makes sense it's not as bad as um uh in uh in la la land when um <laughs> when what's his name is like losing like 30 pounds in between shots Oh, yeah. Uh, Ryan Gosling. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Yeah. Yeah, really. But, it's all like just producers, production companies, and like some location stuff. It's really nothing like the back end people on it. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. They list the, the composers because that beginning of the theme song for the theme. it. It's, it's I know. like one of those well known. Oh, I meant to mention that. I meant to mention that at the very beginning when you said when you asked like how we knew about Dragnet and what we knew about it because once I like I didn't know about it but then once I dove in I was like I've obviously heard that before right everyone's heard that 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 four note uh, 
intro music before and yeah. um i was like that's really funny but then i read on wikipedia i'm not sure if you did that that might not actually be where it originated from yeah i think there was a f- film in the 40s called the killers yes sir i don't yep. know the exact year but i think that's where the theme originated from and then these mm-hmm. that four notes became the dragnet theme and yeah kind of the same thing i was before I was even aware of what Dragnet was, I had heard that many yeah, times. Yeah, it's a classic. It's a classic it's note, you know? Also kind of like, even like going back to Law & Order, Law & Order kind of also has like that four note, like a dun-dun. Yeah. But Law & Order kind of has its own version of that. <laughs> I had never thought of it as a police, police like, musical note, though. You know what I mean? It always felt very, like... Uh, like horror-y almost kind of like a horror vibe i mean i maybe that's what that movie was ernest hemingway um but it it, it definitely it didn't give me cop vibes until you got in there and you're like oh this is kind of i can see this like the law you know the, yeah. the authority like uh, with the with the timpanies so that was i i got it i got it <laughs> yeah it was definitely it, it, I think between that and um, how Jack Webb did it, his dialogue, like the demeanor of it um, when he did the monologue was probably like the two things that made this show kind of like, oh, this this is what the show is. Yeah. Which he kind of he did was abrupt like that, like just the facts and kind of throughout the mm-hmm. show. But it wasn't maybe because it wasn't him talking like he would say a sentence and then somebody else would talk that he didn't notice like his monologue that it was like sentence sentence yeah. sentence <clears throat> so you. he really didn't talk that like his the script wasn't really like that it was like more back and forth constantly all the time mm-hmm. yeah he probably didn't want for it to get like goofy with like um you know just the facts like uh like catchphrases that's the term yeah for. like a catchphrase like I, I think he you know it's he aimed for that show to be realistic and for the acting to be unpretentious as i have down as a quote and so uh for him to just keep saying it every time I, there were definitely there are moments that are like tongue-in-cheek you know like he says like you know i'm a cop my name is friday it's like every time that he, that he says like my name is friday he like looks like just next to the camera <laughs> yeah he like looks back and like i remember he was walking up the stairs my name is friday like what? like <laughs> like came and came, goes back walking up the stairs um but definitely, like, for me, I think it's just enough, you know, where yeah. it's like, you're like, okay, like, that's funny. It's not too much, but it's funny. Um, but I could see, you know, last thing is that, you know, with remakes, the, the remakes, and they've tried to bring it back, you know, and they did the movie in the 80s and, like, or the 70s and was 70s or 80s? Uh, they did two. So two, one in yeah, each? Yeah, the 80s was with Tom Hanks and um, Dan Aykroyd. Dan Aykroyd. Yes. But then what was the other... Uh, there's actually a movie 66? in the 50s. Uh, oh, 54. Oh, really? Yep. Yeah, a 1954 movie, which Jack Webb actually made, and he's starring okay. as Friday. Okay, it was like the, the original crew and stuff. Yeah, it was a theatrical spinoff, which it marked two first in American TV history. It was the first wow. time a TV series spawned a movie. Nice. It was the first time a movie spinoff while it was released while the show was still ongoing. Yeah, it wasn't it didn't end until like what 1959. Yeah, so that the, run first, that, that the first, first yeah, yeah. that first run. Yeah. Cuz he tried to rewrite it again later in the early 60s with um a new style and came up with mm-hmm. that. Mm-hmm. But it was definitely a show that kind of brought up um a new direction of law enforcement kind of videos, uh, kind of shows yeah. and you kind of see it nowadays with now uh, what is it now? All the, the the Chicago on NBC, but Law and Order is still sure. going on and oh yeah, off so many like different that. yeah. Um, but so but this was kind of the very first one, so um, it was definitely a show that's well known and kind of we're glad that we can show it on because it's still yeah. in public domain. Like the companies didn't try to swoop it down and yeah, true get it but shout um, out to them <laughs> but yeah shout out yeah. to them but um yeah so hopefully everybody liked uh watching uh the dragnet tv shows as we like to bring it up in uh the old time series that we're doing between the movies and the tv shows and um keep an eye out for our next radio cast to follow one of the old time uh tv or movie episodes that we do and keep an eye on our 
YouTube channel and our uh, other TV uh, platforms to see what we do next. So I'd like to thank Jack and Joe for this round and uh, keep a lookout for the next episode of RadioCast. Yes, sir. Thanks, guys. Thank you.